With your super suit, I will rule the universe! Well, she can't be any worse than the bozos who rule it now. An excellent point, my jaded little chum! What up? Notice anything different? I got new glasses! But also, I'm working from home. Uh, only problem is, I was so busy buying games and TV shows to watch that I completely forgot to stock up on food before going on lockdown. But don't worry, I'm a survivalist and there's plenty of grubs and worms in my backyard. Speaking of worms, today we're talking about the funniest worm in kids' TV. Don't worry, we're on it! Worms to the rescue! I love those dudes, but I'm talking about everybody's favorite earthworm who's nothing but an overpowered super suit and he's actually pretty cool with that. Without my suit, I'm a helpless worm fighting impossible odds to save the universe! Groovy! Earthworm Jim, which might be the funniest video game adaptation of all time. And if you don't agree, Jim has two words for you. I love that catchphrase. Also, I love eating dirt. So, hmm, I have no food, so I, I gotta eat dirt. So good. Just like Earthworm Jim, which totally holds up today. It's still laugh out loud funny, like deranged, maniacal, laugh out loud funny. And that's why it's also one of the best video game adaptations of all time. The original Earthworm Jim video game was widely beloved for its graphics, music, but most importantly, its satirical, irreverent tone and hilarious randomness. And the show took it to a whole other level. When last we saw our heroes, Psycho and Professor Monkey for a head had turned Jim into a bowl of candy corn. Candy corn? Actually, I'll take a piece of Jim's corn. Yeah. Wait, uh, that came out wrong. I'd really appreciate it if we could cut to the title sequence now. This is everything you didn't know about Earthworm Jim, the animated series. Here's the difference between Earthworm Jim and other video game adaptations of the 80s and 90s like Captain N, Super Mario, Mega Man, and Sonic the Hedgehog. Those shows were all action shows with some comedy and fair share of melodrama. What's your name? I... Oh no! The one exception being Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, which didn't quite land because it felt like a huge deviation from the source material which was more serious action. Earthworm Jim was never that. Even the action beats are super hilarious. Will Jim be eaten alive by the ferocious mutant alligator? Well, that answers that. Earthworm Jim premiered on Kids WB in 1995, nearly 25 years ago, but the jokes still work. Also, for some reason, the promo for it has stuck with me through all these years. Morning, neighbor! Morning, hideous freak of nature. Today on Kids WB, it's Earthworm Jim! Just like the video game, the show was ahead of its time. It was an Adult Swim show before Adult Swim. It was absurd, from the characters, to the world, to the intro theme song, which is super dope, and breaks the fourth wall right off the bat. We think he's mighty fine. A hero for all time! Both the game and the show were willing to go literally anywhere for a joke. The game has Jim fight inside a creature's large intestine because, I mean, why not, right? The show even goes inside Jim's head for no plot purpose whatsoever. I'm hungry! I'm cold! I'm itchy! Where are the girls? Come on, that's good sh Even the planet names were funny, like the water planet they just called the water planet. Meanwhile, on La Planeta de Agua... Arriba! Arriba! That sh gets me every single time. Arriba! The game was a hit because it satirized video game tropes without sacrificing quality, just like the show which told fun stories while satirizing everything, from TV tropes, I'm one of those generic presidents they use on TV to keep shows from becoming dated. To classic movies like Wizard of Oz or Planet of the Apes in the season 2 episode, Peanut of the Apes. Gosh darn them! Gosh darn them all to heck! They did what, Jim? I mean, I like advertising as much as the next person, but this is just plain bad taste! And comic books. They're always making fun of comic books, like in the episode, Bring Me the Head of Earthworm Jim. Those are my comic books! So, are you suggesting they are less than completely factual? Nothing was off limits. They even had haggis jokes. Where's a place no one ever goes? Hey, this haggis stuff is great! It's so random. Who is that even for? Me. I'll take some haggis right now. Even the premise of Earthworm Jim is satirical, because there barely is one. It's about a worm who has a super suit land on him from outer space. 
There is nothing special about Jim. It's all in the suit, which has the power to do anything the plot dictates. I've got you in Blanco suit. The show doesn't really try to explain much. Bad guys do bad things, Jim and his friends stop them, but they also made the characters' personalities really strong, like Jim, who's a very unconventional lead character. He cares about his friends and tries to do the right thing, but he's also maniacal, unhinged, and a little self-obsessed. Forget me. I'm not important. You must let go of the past. A Huh? Hey! You missed my dramatic moment! But my favorite version of Jim is Seinfeld Jim, which goes about as well as you'd expect. You're supposed to find that hilarious! Then there's the supporting characters from the video game who are all satirical in their own way. Like Peter Puppy, who's gentle on the surface except when he gets mad and turns into a giant monster that only attacks Jim, which is straight from the game. <laughs> In the show though, they expand his character and make him Jim's sidekick for every episode except when he gets fired in the pilot, sidekicked. I've gotta get a new sidekick. You understand, don't you? I understand. You're saying I'm a worthless lump of gunk. I mean, at least Jim went easy on him. Great then, so long as you understand. In Peter's defense, he's way better than the replacement sidekicks Jim finds for sale at El Superhero Hut. This here's whooping cough, boy. Got the power of Gale Force Coughs. Then there's Princess What's Her Name, which is a great commentary on how so many video game princesses are underdeveloped objects of the main character's affections. But don't worry, she gets to have her own commentary in the show. You know, Jim, I think you might be helped by medication. Wouldn't we all? Especially now. Also, Jim's other ally is Snot. Snot doesn't appear until late in the original game, but plays a larger role in the sequel. A loyal booger who often makes little sense, even if you understand his indecipherable language. What do we do now? Good suggestion, Snot. He's kind of gross, but nothing like the commercial from the original video game that was pulled off the air in several states for showing a grandma eating worms. I feel you, girl. Rounding out the good guys is yet another joke, the narrator, who fills the audience in with information while also putting the main characters on blast. We rejoin our story on the planet Heck, where Peter... Hey, I'm narrating this flashback here, buddy. right -o, carry on, twit. Then there were the villains, like the game's main arch nemesis, Queen Slug for a Butt, who's actually a really tough boss in the game, well, her butt that is. <laughs> And while Queen Slug for a butt is a mouthful, it's nothing compared to her full regal name. Queen pulsating, bloated, festering, sweaty, pus-filled, malformed slug for a butt. Yo, try saying that three times fast. Actually, I will because I'm stuck at home and bored as hell. Queen pulsating, bloated, festering, sweaty, pus-filled, malformed, f*** it, I I'm not that bored. Are you done? There's lots of other video game villains, of course, like Psycho. I wish meant to be a villain. And I'll start my new job right now! What a psycho, huh? Come on. And Bob the Killer Goldfish, last seen on La Planeta de Agua, Arriba! The day of the fish is at hand! And probably the swollest cat ever, number four. Named so because he's the fourth henchman Bob's had. I wonder what happened to henchmen's one through three. You want to taste some mines? Nah, they're all too slow. But let's not pass over Evil the Cat. Basically, this universe's version of the devil with some major pinky and the brain vibes. I will use its fantastic power to destroy the universe. Wait, just thought of something. Uh, Evil the Cat and Eek the Cat cousins? Huh? Probably not. But my favorite of the hilarious villains is Professor Monkey for a head, whose head is part human and also part whole monkey. I've got a monkey grafted to my head. And yo, do they have a complicated relationship? No, I was not making eyes at that gorilla. I do not want to see what a bathroom break is like for those two. Actually, yes I do. Someone draw that for me. For some reason I can't get that shape out of my head. See how the show is super nuts but in a great way? Wait, wouldn't the monkey end up all over the professor's back? Anyway, this show is delightfully nuts, just like the game. Like when Jim had to navigate the planet heck and overcome obstacles like elevator music, shadow demons, and lawyers. All right, real quick. I remember playing that level for the first time as a kid and loving every single second of it. That music cue. That game 
is dope. But that's the type of skewering commentary that became a staple of the show. This spell will require the most loathsome things in existence. Eye of Newt, Black Cat's Bone, Thrice Boiled at Midnight. You may already have one letter. The show was lucky it had such great source material. But how did the game come about? Earthworm Jim the video game was developed by David Perry and his company Shiny Entertainment, which was named after this R.E.M. song. Shiny. That video kind of reflects the colorful nature of the show, doesn't it? Now, Perry also helped develop some of my favorite childhood games like Paperweight 2, the Aladdin game, that magic carpet level, I still have flashbacks, and also did some conversion work on the first TMNT game for the NES, which was a big deal as explained by Perry himself. Playmates contacted me and said, you made the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. Um, would you like to, um, to come here and be an employee of Playmates and help us get into the game industry. Playmates, of course, is Playmates toys. Not what you're thinking. Come on. You remember, they made the Ninja Turtle toys and they wanted another hit action figure. So their plan was to create a hit video game and TV show and then make the toy after, which is completely reversed. Ah. Uh... But it kind of worked. The Earthworm Jim game and show did well, but the toys weren't so popular. So Playmates did it backwards and got backwards results, which is kind of appropriate for Jim since the whole tone of the show is off kilter. Though none of it would have happened if not for a simple drawing of a worm by storyboard artist Doug Tenabel, seen here. Am I supposed to recognize you? I am your creator. Just look. Today, Bull must have put a lot of thought into the creation of Jim. I mean, it had to have taken him like his entire life, right? I'd made it that weekend to show. Yeah. A weekend? It's crazy. Tenable later helped design game levels and even voiced Jim in the game, but he also played a role in the show, serving as an executive producer and writing several episodes, including the episode, The Origins of Peter Puppy. Go, thou evil spirits, possess this small dog. Tenable's involvement is very unusual for a TV show. Most video game adaptations don't actually involve the game creators, but this one did, which is why it captures the spirit of the source material so well. Like how the show loved making fun of paperwork. Cause who likes paperwork? I don't. <laughs> which of course we see in the game when Jim gets attacked by a filing cabinet. You ever stub your toe in a filing cabinet? That hurts. Perry and Shiny Entertainment went off the rails developing the game. Why? Because the unpredictability of the game and the show is what made it so fun, as David Perry explains. I think that's actually very powerful when you're when the, when the game isn't just this one wash, rinse, and repeat idea over and over and over. Um, it's it's like you go to the next level. What I mean, what are you going to be doing in the next Earthworm Jim level? Good luck guessing. Which is how you got bonkers levels in the games like Totally Forked, which takes place in a giant food pantry, or bonkers worlds in the show like The Planet of Creamy Foods. There they must cross the mighty sea of mayonnaise. Gross, but I'd eat it. I think I've got a puke. As well as one of the best jokes in video games, where you begin the game by launching a cow up and off screen, only for it to appear at the very end after you've beaten every boss and saved the princess. That's a slow burn. The show also ends every episode with their own falling cows, which is a nice reoccurring Easter egg. And here's one more. They use actual levels from the game as settings in the show, like the level down the tubes seen here. <laughs> the original game dropped in 1994. It went over a lot of fans with its distinctive level design, but angered others like me by leaving out the level intestinal distress in the SNES version. Damn platform exclusivity, man. Ugh, he dirt. Why am I still... Ah, that's it for this gag, it's f***ing gross. But us SNES fans who missed out on that level, the show had plenty of intestinal escapades, just like I'm about to have after eating dirt. Our latter-day Jonah makes his way to the center of the anti-fish. Shiny quickly developed a follow-up game that was just as well received called Earthworm Jam 2, which features my favorite use of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Huh? Come on. It was just as nuts as the first, featuring sentient furniture. Of course, the show had its own version as well. Ah, I've got lots of evil furniture to fight! See? Synergy. 
There were more sequels to the games, but they were all disappointments, especially Earthworm Jim 3D, which was originally supposed to tie into the show much more heavily, even featuring Evil Jim, who was a show creation, as its main arch nemesis. Evil Jim! Hey, I know that guy. The games unfortunately got worse because Perry's company was bought out by Interplay Productions, who were known for games like Fallout and two of my favorites, Rock and Roll Racing and Clay Fighter. Unfortunately, Perry ended up working on other games, while Tenapel left the company to develop other TV projects like Cat Scratch, which is perfect since he'd had a lot of experience writing insane cats. And Swole Cat, number four is f Diesel. Unlike the game, the show maintained the same creative team throughout its entire two season run. First, there was showrunner Doug Langdale, who was the story editor of the Aladdin TV show and wrote tons of great episodes like Anti Fish, about the giant fish who ate Jim earlier. Remember? Yeah, Jim explodes him. <laughs> Langdale developed the show and made very few changes from the game. Though, a few characters didn't make the jump, including Chuck. Fifi, Major Mucus, and Wilbur the Pet Pig. Also, they changed where Jim's from. In the game, he's from New Junk City, a play on New Jack City. You know, rock a baby. rock a baby. In the show, it's an Earth-like world called Turlock, which is inspired by Doug Tenapel's hometown in California, Turlock. Morning, neighbor! And voicing them all was an incredible voice cast, starting at the top with Jim, voiced by Homer Simpson himself, Dan Castellaneta, which also came while The Simpson was really exploding in 1995. All right, Brain. You don't like me and I don't like you. But let's just do this and I can get back to killing you with fear. He was inescapable. You nefarious yet strangely handsome fiend! <laughs> you can never escape me! Side note, I always thought his evil Jim sounded a lot like early Krusty. Hope all you kids come out this weekend and really pack this place. Yeah? Maybe? No? Okay. Then there's Jeff Bennett, who voices Peter Puppy and the narrator. Morning in the sleepy town of Turlock. Flowers bloom, birds sing. And later on, went to do the voice of Johnny Bravo. <laughs> hey, Judge Gorgeous, may I please the court? SCTV star and comedy icon Andrea Martin voiced Queen Slug for a butt. Victory is mine! Worm! <laughs> Charlie Adler played Professor Monkey for a head. Oh, will you stop that? It is time to get evil! After he had already starred as Ickes in Ah Real Monsters. Mm, mm, oh, caboose! Voice acting vet Jim Cummings voiced Psycho. The magic has gone out of being a nefarious space villain over here. And Bob the Killer Goldfish. If only I weren't stuck in this stupid bowl, I'd conquer the universe! You definitely know him, because he's the voice of Winnie the Pooh. I don't remember thinking that through. But come on, he was also Monterey Jack on Rescue Rangers. Now don't jump to conclusions, Jippo! And he's Pete in Goof Troop and the Goofy movies. Side goof. Let a pro show you how it's done. Then there was Brad Garrett as a Lord of Nightmares just one year before Everybody Loves Raymond. You the troublemakers? I got one monster in tears and three others questioning the monsterhood. And you got Ben Stein because he was in everything in the 90s. Hello, I'm Dr. Houston. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> you know, that was real funny about the first 500 times I heard it. Not to mention, we had an appearance from the Crypt Keeper himself, John Kassir. Hope you enjoyed our little bedtime story, kids. Who voiced Snot? <laughs> I don't know, Snot. And Hench Rat, who had a great running gag of saying thank you whenever Evil the Cat beat him up. Don't forget Hench Rat, boss. Ow! Thank you. And how's this for a little EYDK synergy? Cat Saucy played Princess What's Her Name. I have the strength of a hundred men. My favorite obscure villain, the goddess of disco. Excuse me, can't hear a thing when I'm listening to my walk god. And she was Princess Sally Acorn on Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic, he's turned back. See? Full circle. With that kind of cast, it's really no wonder why the show was so good. Earthworm Jim was above all original. Thanks to its clever writing, standout voice acting, and wacky source material. This show holds up as one of the funniest video game TV shows ever. Now, it only ran for 23 episodes, but if you're looking for more Earthworm Jim, there's actually plenty of stuff out there, like the awesome toy line. They had tons of great features, but nothing like this. Whatever happens to this doll will also happen to you. Is anyone else disappointed they never made a Gabby Scabby doll? Because I am. Did 
Oh, my Gabby Scabby doll. But Jim also appeared in a few other games, like Game Boy Colors, Earthworm Jim, Menace to the Galaxy, and Clay Fighters 63 and a third. He also had his own comic book line with Marvel in the 90s, which featured some really, really dope art. And finally, there's always hope that they'll release a new game, which might not be so far-fetched. It's reportedly in development and slated to hit the new Intellivision in the new future, to which I say... Yeah, Ruby! Do y'all remember in the game where you could just spam the button and remix him saying that? Like, groovy, gro 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 groovy, groovy. Gro groovy, groovy. Can't be the only one. All right, now go and watch Earthworm Jim. It's only 23 episodes added to your quarantine watch list. Or better yet, go play through the game. Matter of fact, do both. We ain't got nothing but time. Now tell me what your favorite gag is from the show. Let me know in the comments below. Have a nice day. Thanks for watching for, oh, for uh, new episodes I drop every other week, make sure you subscribe over here. And for older episodes or just more of everything you didn't know, click over here.